As Bernie mentioned, we're going to talk today about the early stage metallurgical evaluation, or ESME. And Andy will follow up behind sort of how he starts, he's using, using the, the data from his perspective as a geological consultant. So hopefully you can hear me. Um, so what are we going to talk about? Uh, we're going to have a little bit of an introduction uh, into resource development studies. Uh, and then, then going to start talking about process mineralogy uh, and then following on through to, uh, for the people in the audience that are not metallurgists, a little bit of an indication or introduction into the different um, processing options. I'm then going to talk a little bit about acid rock drainage. Uh, and then, then I'm going to sort of talk about ESME, why do we use it, what are the case studies, and then some fi final thoughts. So, resource development studies. Here is a, a, a sort of diagram on how SGS um, sort of uh, provides sort of testing um, from the development of a project. So, basically from expiration all through to closure. What we're going to talk about today is the part in orange, which is the metallurgical and mineralogy uh, testing. Uh, we can, you know, we, generally um, we provide testing or, or for metallurgy and mineralogy from the resource development stage all the way through to construction. Uh, mineralogy and metallurgical testing we also provide in, in production in terms of process mineralogy, um, mine plant surveys and things like that. Um, we also do mineralogy and ARD studies in terms of which we haven't got here but it's in this area for the closure, so if there's any mine closures, we do mineralogy and, and things like that as well in terms of environmental uh, perspective. But, however, what if you can start looking at mineralogy and metallurgy more at an earlier stage of exploration? So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So generally, when you're doing a, a resource evaluation or you've got a project, you'll start off you know, doing some exploration You'll then get to the, the PEA stage, which is basically, you know, the sort of economic analysis of a potential viability of a mineral resource. Um, it's based on, you know, the assessment is based on if it's measured, indicated, or inferred, or any combination of these. We sort of, uh, at this point, look at um, things in terms of capital costs, operating costs, and things like that. But basically, it's a basic... Oh, sorry. Um, proof of concept. So can we produce a concentrate? What is the quality of it and how much of it? So it's a very high level understanding from a metallurgical perspective um, of the ore deposit. So the next stage is the PFS or the pre-feasibility study. Uh, this is where we're looking at um, the economic viability and basically we're now sort of looking at the effective method of the mineral processing is determined. So what, is the, what are we going to do to extract the metal or the mineral um, from that deposit? Um, it has a basically a lower confidence level than a feasibility study, but at this point, from a metallurgical perspective, we're actually defining the aspects of the flow sheet. And then you get on to the, the DFS, or the Definitive Feasibility Study, uh, where you're looking at the comprehensive technical and economic um, study of the selected development options. So at this point, you've, you've got your flow sheet, you sort of understand what's going on, but now you're sort of now you're tweaking it and refining it. So basically, this, the results of this study will um, reasonably serve as the basis for the final decision or for, for, by a proponent or a financial institution to proceed with or finance the development of a project. Uh, the confidence level of this study will be higher than that of a PFS. So now what we're doing is we're confirming assumptions, we're improving the economics. At this point, from a metallurgical perspective, you're, you're doing a lot of met work to sort of tweak your uh, flow sheet, but then you get onto the pilot plan. So you're now starting to look at more bulk tonnage and, and look at um, how you know, the whole the ore body is going to um, recover, basically, the metal recovery. So, this is how, you know, just to summarize, this is how it's defined, the PEA through the PFS and the DFS from, from a metallurgical perspective. But what, if you, oh, but what if you could sort of get in at an earlier stage at expiration? Why not look at metal recovery at that point? 
So that's what um, ESME is sort of uh, designed to do, to have a very early stage indication of the metallurgical and mineralogical um, under characterization. So there is different parts of ESME. Um, there is the mineralogy part, so I'm going to talk a little bit about process mineralogy today. I'm a mineralogist at heart, so I have to, to add it. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the metallurgical processing options, and then acid rock drainage. And these are the three main components of ESME. And then I'll, I'll talk about uh, the ESME part. So automated mineralogy. Uh, a lot of you have probably been to a lot of my talks, so, uh, but if you haven't, um, Basically, automated mineralogy is characterized by an automated scan electron microscope. And there are various different um, solutions on the market. The most well-known is QuemScan and MLA, or the two well-known. Well uh, but there's also a new one, uh, which is called TEMA. Uh, TEMA is very similar to QuemScan and MLA, uh, but it's a new um, product or a new system on the market uh, that provides us the same or similar data and actually can be better data than the QuemScan and the MLA. There are other um, solutions on the market like uh, Mineralogic Mining by Carl Zeiss, um, the MinScan, and then there's a couple of others called Inca Mineral and Amex. So what is QuemScan? SGS is very well known for QuemScan. I'm a, I'm a QuemScan mineralogist. Um, we have 11 uh, QuemScan units around the world. Uh, basically, it's the quanti quantitative evaluation of uh, minerals by scan electron microscopy. Um, it was developed in Australia in the 1970s by CSIRO. That's a large um, government um, research group. Um, it was then with MLA at that same point, so that those two were developed there. Uh, and then in the 1980s and the 1990s, there was hardware, software developments. It was then, QuemScan was then commercialized in, in 2003 as Intellection. This was then bought out by FEI. Um, and then in this decade, um, it's basically gone more into the oil and gas industry, though there are still QuemScans around, obviously. But, however, as SGS, we've decided to look at other technologies. Um, we're starting to invest in the TEMA, um, which is basically, um, it's, it's, a, again, a scan electron microscope. We, we have our first installation was in Santiago in Chile, and now we have another instrument in, in Lakefield in Ontario as well. And basically, it's the same as the QuemScan, but it's, it's newer, in fact, and it's a newer uh, technology, and it basically gives you more resolution for gold um, and also for the sort of rare earth type deposits. So... We have this technology, what's, what's the sort of data that we produce? For process mineralogy, um, these are the standard deliverables. So you can have your modal mineralogy, so it's characterizing what minerals are in your sample. If it's a sulfide ore, it'll characterize all the sulfides, it'll characterize all of the silicates, um, you know, oxides, clays, for example. So it can give you an overall understanding of your sample. And a lot of the time, you can get a lot of information just from your modal mineralogy. You know, it'll characterize all those sulfides. You can see how much clay is going to be in there. If that has implications from a processability uh, perspective from, for metallurgical testing. However, you can do other things. So you can do uh, grain size. So we can look at the D50, or we can look at grain size of different uh, minerals. We can look at the grain size of gold, for example. Uh, we also can look at elemental deportment. Elemental deportment is critical. You know, generally you do an assay. Um, you can see, okay, you might have got a copper. You might say, oh, okay, we've got some good copper grade here. But may not be all your copper. It might not be in the sulfides. You might have some copper in clays. You might have some copper in iron oxides, especially if you're going to a, an oxide zone of a porphyry. So elemental deportment gives you that more um, information. The next one, which is sort of standard, uh, process mineralogy is liberation and association. You know, you're looking at how liberated a particular mineral is and what, and what are the middling particles associated with. Uh, the next one, exposure, is a little bit adapted to liberation. Uh, what we're doing is we're looking at the exposure of a, of a mineral. So this exposure can be for flotation or leaching. How much is that, that uh, mineral exposed um, to be leached or to be floated. Potential recovery is basically uh, a mixture of exposure and association. So 
We, we are trending, trending to do more in terms of uh, exposure. Uh, we find that that's a better KPI um, to look at um, how a mineral or a metal is going to be recovered over liberation. So we're starting to look at liberation, exposure, and association. And then the other one is, is sort of grade recovery curves. A lot of you have probably seen those, that you can do mineralogically limiting grade recovery curves. We can also do things like mineral release curves as well, um, which is looking at, at particle size versus uh, liberation. So I talked about a little bit about elemental deportment. Here's an example. Uh, here we have uh, basically a copper deposit. And when you start looking at your copper assay, as I mentioned before, you think, oh, it's all in your sulfides. But in this example, uh, you can actually see you've got some copper within silicates, within iron ore, within malachite. And, and in terms of recovery, recovery sorry, th this is basically non-recoverable. So you can start using just elemental deportment and modal mineralogy. You can actually get um, some really good information in terms of your metals that you're trying to recover. Generally, um, the QEM scan or the TEMA, we can actually use um, theoretical chemistries or we can use the, the actual chemistry of um, the, the minerals that, that come out of the TEMA system. Um, but we tend to add that on. We tend to use an electron microprobe or laser ablation. Uh, this will actually give us more um, better detection limits in terms of if there's sort of uh, lower amounts of, say, copper within, within a clay. Uh, we can then take that data and we can add that into the QEMScan and the TEMA uh, software and we can then come up with this, this full deportment. This is the standard liberation and association. Um, here's this typical graph um, or bar chart size by size liberation and association. Here on the side is actually um, the actual particles. So you can see, you know, here you've got fully liberated uh, galena. Here you've got some galena with pyrite, some galena with spalerite, and complex particles. And as you can see, t generally, um, when you're doing it size by size, you can see how liberation increases uh, with a decrease in particle size. That's a sort of standard um, data. The other way to look at it is, in, is exposure. Here we've got an example of copper sulfide exposure. Here you can see, um, in this uh, example here visually, you can see how exposure is increasing as you go down. So you can look at the sort of degree of, we're looking at this example of copper sulfides, which is in yellow. You can see here that these are fully exposed particles and then you're starting to get particles with some other minerals uh, attached to it to the point of um, you'll get fully locked particles. And in terms of for leaching or flotation, those fully locked particles will be um, unrecoverable unless potentially you, you grind it finer. So that was just a quick uh, overview of sort of process mineralogy. Um, now I'm going to sort of talk, briefly go over some of the sort of com uh, metallurgical testing. Um, and then we'll, we'll go into ARD. So what is metallurgy? Basically, it's the extraction of metals or minerals from an ore to produce a concentrate. And then we convert that into a commercial use, like smelting or construction, for example. So. The first, you know, first part you've got to do is you've got to crush your rock down, so you've got to look at comminution. Um, so basically you're trying to reduce your, your rocks down to a fine material. So you're going to crush it, you're going to grind it, for example. And it's the most expensive and energy consuming part of your mill. So you can crush your sample. Um, what you can do is a couple of, of different tests. Um, you can do the bond low energy impact test, or the CWI. Um, you can also do the SPI crusher index to look at um, KPIs, look at that to, to for um, the crushing. Then you can look at semi-autogenous grinding. Um, so you can look at basically reducing the, the particle size down again. And here you can do a different laboratory tests in terms of JK drop weight, SAG mill, the SMC or the SPI test, which is the SGS um, test. Then you have to grind it down again. So now you're starting to look at the ball mill. Now you're trying to get it down to in the micron range. So in this, at this point, you're looking at, in terms of laboratory testing, you're looking at um, the Bonn rod mill, or the RWI, and then the Bonn ball mill work index, which is the BWI. So that's, I'm just quickly going through the sort of different tests. So once you've, you've crushed and you ground your rock down, how are you going to start liberating or concentrating 
those um, minerals or metals. So the first part, you know, most simplest part is by gravity, looking at the SG of, of whatever uh, mineral um, that you, that you want to concentrate. So you can look at things in terms of, um, in the coarse end, you can look at dense media se uh, separation or DMS. You can look at shaking tables or spirals. Um, and then if you're looking at the more finer end, if you're looking for uh, gold deposits and things like that, you can look at centrifugal concentration or a multi-gravity separator. So in terms of laboratory testing, you can do HLS, which is heavy liquid separation. So you get a, a heavy liquid media and you can separate the, the, the different um, minerals based on their SG. Or you can look at uh, Moseley or, or Wilfley table. Here's an example of a Wilfley table which comes from Cornwall, by the way, where I, where I come from. And the, you can also look at things like Nelson and Falcon in terms of um, gravity recoverable centrifugal concentration. So if you can't get it by gravity, if you can't concentrate all your sample or, or your minerals by gravity, you can look at magnetic separation. Now this is looking at basically the magnetic susceptibility sorry, um, of minerals. So you've got to have particular minerals, obviously. Not all minerals are magnetic. So these, this is only really applicable to certain types of deposits. So if you're looking at an iron ore deposit, for example, uh, you might be you know, trying to concentrate your magnetite. Um, sometimes you might be, pyrotite might be an issue, so you might use MagSep to get um, pyrotite out. Uh, we tend to use it for iron ore, uh, sorry, iron ores, rare earths as well, so um, to separate out certain um, different minerals. And the different tests that you can do is the Davis tube test. Uh, you can also do like drum magnets, limbs, or you can do uh, whims as well. So there's different magnetic um, separation. If you can't get it by uh, magnetic separation, you can use froth flotation. Uh, basically, you're looking at the hydrophobic minerals um, that are recovered by air. Um, and then you can look at in terms of flow, the flow sheet is generally a, a rougher which is the recovery, and then you clean that, which is the cleaner, and that's the gray. So you can do, uh, in terms of uh, batch tests, which are rougher, cleaner, or the MFT, which is, the MFT is an SGS test. Or you can do lock cycle tests, which generally follows the, the sort of roughers and the cleaner tests, and then you can go on to the pilot plant. Um, we also have a mini pilot plant as well um, at SGS. So, sorry, I went too fast. Um, the next part is, is heat leaching. So if you can't get it by flotation or magnetic separation or gravity, if you've got a very high, um, low grade, high volume um, deposit, you might start looking at heat leaching. Um, basically, what you're doing is the leaching chemicals are percolating through the um, ore heap and the solution is collected and treated to recover the leach metals. Now, this could be gold or it could be copper. Um, so generally, it's well known, well known for, for gold. Um, generally, when you're looking at the, for gold projects, you're looking, um, you can't really use it on a refractory ore. Um, but the sort of testing that you can do is coarse bottle rolls or columns. We actually can also do this for, for copper as well. You can also look at hydrometallurgy, um, basically, which is part of heat, uh, leaching, is, is your leaching, um, your your metal, so you can do atmospheric leaching, you can do press, pressure oxidation leaching or pox, you can do bacterial leaching or biox or pressure leaching, which is HPAL. You can roast it, you can acid bake it, you can calcine it, so there's different ways of, of trying to get that metal out of um, your mineral. And you can do solution purification in terms of solvent extraction, ion exchange, precipitation, absorption, uh, and cement, uh, cementation, sorry. So that was a sort of very quick overview of the metallurgical side. So another part of it is the acid rock drainage. What are you going to do with your waste rock and your tailings that's produced? So acid rock drainage is basically also known as acid mine drainage. Um, and what it is is the outflow of acidic water from products of a mining operation such as waste rock and or tailings, um, as well as from rock surfaces in open pits and underground workings. So basically, ARD um, is formed by the oxidation of sulfide minerals. So for example, pyrite and pyrotite. Pyrotite is very well known to oxidate very fast. Um, but also you have pyrite, even all your other sulfides as well. 
um, when exposed to atmospheric conditions such as oxygen and water. This acidic water then moves through the environment. It leaches additional metals from the surrounding rocks. So it could start leaching out things like, you know, mercury, selenium, whatever, you know, whatever is, is, is around. So where the ore body or host rocks lacks sufficient acid neutralizing capacity in the form of carbonate uh, minerals, the resulting toxic solution of the hazardous elements may have a severe impact on aquatic and or terrestrial terrestrial ecosystems. So we have two different types of ARD testing. Um, the first one is static testing. So this is usually low cost uh, over a short period of time of days. And basically it helps to evaluate the balance between acid generating and acid neutralizing capacity of a sample. So there's different tests. There's the acid-based accounting, which you have the SOBEC, ABA, the modified ABA. You also have net acid generation or the NAG test. You have kinetic NAG and you have the shape flask extraction test as well. So those are quick uh, understanding of how your metal is, is leaching or your sulfides are oxidizing. The other way is to look at it over a longer period, which is kinetic testing. And basically these are a couple of examples here of uh, humidity cells, which is part of uh, kinetic testing. And what it is is basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to mimic the natural oxidation, oxidation reactions. And what you do is you get your sample, you put it in, into the little humidity cell, and over a period of time, generally 40 weeks, um, what you're doing is you're testing um, the oxidation of particular minerals, you know, if you're sulfides or you're neutralizing potential of your carbonates. And basically, this, these tests provide information on the rate of, as I mentioned, of the sulfide mineral oxidation and therefore acid production, as well as indication of the drainage water quality. So um, going through all of that, how do we start putting all those different parts in, in, into, into ESME? So basically ESME is a new metallurgical and mineralogical product by SGS, and it provides an early indication of the metallurgical response mineralogy and ARD potential of your ore body. So it's aimed at base metals um, or gold at the exploration or PEA stage or for due diligence on multiple projects. So why, why do you want to do it? So basically it provides an early indication of your payable metal recovery. Um, you can use it um, to attract financing and or partners. You could use it for due diligence. Um, of major, for major mining companies or private equity firms, and it can be used to differentiate multiple projects within the same portfolio um, in terms of no go or no go of future development. And it also provides an indication, so what's the value? It provides an indication of the recoverable versus the unrecoverable metal of interest. Uh, and it also gives you very early stage indication of potential flow sheet consi considerations and what you're also getting is you're actually getting some mineralogy data, so you can start looking at what sort of gold, for example, is in your sample, uh, what's your main copper sulfide minerals you know, in your sample as well. But, and it also gives you um, some indication on your tailings um, from an ARD perspective. Is it going to be acid generating or is it, is it going to be neutral? So we have two uh, sort of separate uh, packages which are very similar. We've got one for, for gold projects and one for base metals. Generally, we need about a, a two kilo com composite. Um, core is the best, um, but if you have RC chips or even coarse assay rejects, we can use those. Uh, basically, what is the, the scope um, of, or what is the scope of this product? Um, so you'll get head mineralogy, what minerals are in your sample and how much of those. You'll get some head assays, uh, depending on the project, you'll get a gold head assay, essentially silver, sulfur. Then we do um, the metallurgical test work, so we'll do, uh, for gold, we'll do a gravity, so we'll put the two kilo sample through a, through a Nelson concentrator, we'll get a, a concentrate and a tailing. We'll take, we'll take that concentrate, we'll do some mineralogy and some head assays, or assaying, sorry, and then we'll take the tailing um, and we'll float it. Uh, then we also obviously produce a con and a tail. We'll take um, assays and mineralogy of the concentrate. 
Uh, we then take that flotation tail and then we'll leach it. Uh, so you get mineralogy on the various different products and then the, the, the leached tail, um, we then do a modified ABA. So the deliverables, um, you'll get, as I mentioned, the bulk mineralogy of this and sulfide deportment and liberation. You also get gold deportment, so what gold minerals in your sample? Is it native gold, electrum, castellite, for example? What is the liberation um, of that gold and the exposure and the size? As I mentioned, the metallurgical testing, you'll get a mass balance in terms of the metal recovery, and then some commentary uh, on possible flow sheet considerations. And you will also get the AR ARD potential um, using the modified ABA of the tailings. For base metals, again, um, a two kilo composite. As I mentioned, um, core is best, but if you have RC, trip, ch RC chips or core size to reject, we can use that as well. Uh, the base, you know, it's the same as um, the gold package. It's just sometimes, uh, generally, we wouldn't have uh, the gravity in it, so we'll just go straight to flotation and we wouldn't really leach it. So it's basically a, a flotation, just to look at um, the metal recovery. Again, we'll have mineralogy on uh, the concentrate in the tailings and the modified ABA. We can also add on, and we can, we do, we can do this for the gold uh, pr uh, product as well. So you, if you want to look at initial indication of hardness, we can do a BWI. For the base metal, uh, we can also add gravity. So we can add, swap in, and, and swap out uh, different tests depending on, on, on the needs. Again, the, the deliverables, um, bulk mineralogy, what's your sulfides, what's your, if it's a copper project, what is your uh, copper deportment, uh, if it's polymetallic, what's your uh, lead zinc um, deportment, your liberation, uh, again, mass balance for metallurgical testing and commentary on potential flow sheet uh, consider combinations, and again, the ARD potential. So those are the sort of uh, specifics. This is a sort of example of the report. Um, these are just the major um, titles. So basically you'll have sample preparation, head characterization in terms of chemical and, and head mineralogy. Uh, you'll have metallurgical test work and depending on what the flow sheet is, you, know, you might have gravity, flotation, cyanide leaching, and then a little bit about the environmental testing and then the overall results and flow sheet considerations um, as part of that. It's, it's going to be about five to six pages, depending on the information and the number of samples. Um, it's a memo style report, as I mentioned, five to six pages. Uh, and all the results are summarized, though we do have all the other data. So if you wanted some of the data, um, we do have that as well. Uh, as I mentioned, it'll have the flow sheet options, and we'll actually compare it to our SGS project database. So you probably well know, you know, we've, we've been doing a lot of metallurgical testing for many years. So we'll actually go back and look at um, the, the recovery, sorry, and the information, and we will compare it to our SGS uh, database. So we can say, okay, it looks like this type of uh, project, right? and this is the potential flow sheet that we did for, the, for that project. So I've got a couple of case studies, um, and I'll show you how we, we used ESME for, for these two particular uh, projects. The first one is actually what, what Andy is going to talk about uh, in a bit. Um, it's basically uh, a gold um, ESME that we did in, from the Yukon Territory for a strike point, gold. Um, which is an early expiration phase. Um, we had three composites from assay reject. Um, which were composited based on the expiration assays. Um, and what we did was we looked at gold, silver, and copper recovery. So what we did was we took the sample and we ground it to a primary grind of 150 micron, P80. Uh, we then did the head mineralogy. Um, we did the metallurgical test work in terms of gravity using the Nelson concentrator. We then um, take the, took the gravity tailings and did a rougher flotation. We then took the rougher tailings and did a bottle roll, cyanide leaching on it. We then assayed, obviously, the different products and mineralogy on those products for sulfide and, and gold mineralogy. So a couple of examples of some of the deliverables here. Uh, this is the mineralogy. Um, 
The three samples, the three composites were fairly similar uh, in terms of their mineralogy. Uh, a lot of it was basically you know, quartz and, and all the silicates with a little bit of uh, chalcopyrite and sphalerite. Um, so they were very similar in the, in the mineral mineralogical sense. Um, here we're looking at the gold liberation. So we looked at uh, the gold. Uh, generally, the gold was pretty much uh, native gold. Um, and you can see in terms of the three different composites, um, the, they had different uh, liberations. So for example, composite one um, had about 50, 56 uh, percent um, liberated, whereas comp two had a little bit more liberated gold uh, compared to comp three. So you can look at generally the, the liberation. And if it's not liberated, you can then look at the association um, of the different, of the gold with other minerals. So you can see that, for example, in this case, I'm just trying to, for comp three, you can see this one, uh, about 19% of the gold is actually associated with, associated with copper sulfides. So you can start looking at, okay, what's, what's your sort of gold associated with? So here is the, the mass balance um, of, the, of the different uh, three composites. You can see most of the gold, if we just quickly look at the gold distribution, um, basically 90% um, of the gold, over 90% of the gold was recoverable via gravity flotation leaching. Um, so obviously indicated some, some good recoveries, but um, if you notice some of the grades were, um, so you got like 0.98 uh, grams per ton for this one. This one's a very low grade, 0 0.03. And then this one was the middle one, which was 0.27. So we had three different sort of, uh, you know, high, me medium, and low um, grades. But again, they all acted very um, similar uh, in terms of recovery. So just to summarize that case study, um, Chuck Pyrite was the main copper sulfide uh, in that particular deposit with greater than 85% of the chalcopyrite in the gravity tailings reporting to the flotation concentrate. Um, the, we saw that it was a combination of gravity, flotation, and leach test resulted in significant gold recoveries from about 90% to 99%. Uh, um, and so basically the potential for gravity, flotation, leaching uh, but obviously, this can be further optimized um, by looking at the feed size, grinds, flotation reagent do dosages, and such and so forth. Um, so using these um, results, it gave the client confidence in the project, doubled their drilling budget the following year, and Andy will talk about that in a minute. So the second case study, um, basically, it's in Western Canada. Again, it's another early exploration project. Here we're just looking at two composites based on rock samples, grab samples. Um, again, we looked at copper, silver, and, and, and gold recovery. We took the same primary grind of a P80 of 150 micron. Uh, we did the head mineralogy, same as the first case study. We did gravity using the Nelson concentrator. We then take the gravity tailings, um, and we did the rougher flotation. We then took the rougher tailings and did uh, cyanide leach. Uh, again, we, we assayed the product um, for the mass balance, and we did the mineralogy um, for the sulfide and, and gold. And at this point, we actually also did the modified ABA on the tailings to look at the acid generation potential. So um, basically, this is the mass balance. Um, so what we have is from the two different samples, you can see again, um, a lot of the gold, 50% um, for this one, uh, was recovered to the gravity concentrate. This one, about 62% was, was recovered. And then there was a significant amount also recovered um, by flotation as well. And we ended up with basically 11% um, and 10% um, in the uh, leached out as well. So again, it was good recovery uh, based on that, that P80. So hopefully you can see this. This is some of the information in terms of the mineralogy. Uh, basically, the two comps are very similar, dominated by quartz, uh, also a lot of carbonates. So this dark green is carbonates. Um, so basically, it's quartz carbonates. Uh, the deportment of the gold, uh, basically, we had native gold and electrum in the samples. Um, this one, 
more electrum. Well, the both actually had a lot of electrum in there over of the gold, and then there was some native gold as well. And then the bottom is looking at, this time looking at exposure. So you can see that a lot of the gold is very well exposed. We've got very, very well exposed um, gold in, in these samples at that grind size. We also did um, the modified ABA. So here um, we looked at the tailings, or basically the leach residues. And we did um, basically all the modified ABA testing in terms of paste pH, uh, total inorganic carbon, uh, carbonate carbon, such and so forth. Um, and we also did a 51 element ICP scan. Um, and what it showed basically, you want to look at these two numbers here, the modified MP and the net MP. Uh, because of the high carbonate content and the low total sulfur content, if you look, the actual total sulfur is really low. Um, basically, it showed that it's not the, the tailings produced were not acid generating because there's a lot of carbonates around. So, um, some conclusions from from this from this ESME. Um, basically, the main sulfides are pyrite marcosite, so um, iron sulfides. The copper, actually, in this case, it was actually wasn't chalcopyrite; it was actually native copper. Um, we also, obviously, I mentioned before, um, we had, uh, we've got native gold and, and electrum. There was also some silver in there as well. So we found some silver sulfides, some silver and mercury tellurides, and also cinnabar. So that, that could be a potential issue down the road. Um, potentially, you know, there's some silver, uh, sorry, mercury minerals floating around. Um, so at this early stage, you know, we can start seeing these sort of things pop up. Um, so a combination of uh, gravity flotation in each test resulted in uh, significant gold recoveries from 97 to 99%. As I mentioned before, the modified ABA showed that the tailings were non-acid generating because of the high carbonate content, low sulfide. So again, similar to the other one, there's potential for gravity flotation leaching. However, you know, you can start looking at it from... Uh, perspective of you could start looking at them individually and maybe select, you know, you might just do a gravity float or you might do a gravity leach depending on, um, you know, when you start looking at the scoping level testing. So, um, and you can also further optimize um, the work using, you know, again, looking at feed size, grind size, um, flotation reagent dosages. But it gives you an early indication of what, what's going on. So, um, sort of in terms of the, f the final thoughts, uh, basically, as I mentioned before, it, it provides an early indication of the potential of a project and the payable metal recovery. Um, you can also get an indication of the tailings um, from mineralogy and ARD analysis. You can also look at, um, you know, established portfolio of project priorities, identification of uh, potential uh, joint venture opportunities, and it allows the technical team a better understanding of potential flow sheet considerations. You know, you can compare it, as I mentioned before, we can compare it to um, other projects um, and producing mines from our SGS database. And it provides reassur reassurance and potentially entices investors. So that's my part. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Andy, but before that, I, I should probably read out his bio. Um, <laughs> um, Andy is a professional geologist living in Vancouver who has tailored his career to bring change to the minerals industry. Uh, since 2014, he's established his consulting business, SGDS Hive, uh, which takes on graduate geoscience, geoscientists and mentors them through a variety of exploration projects to help engage and educate the next generation of geologists. He also started a nonprofit society, society called Below BC, to provide outreach to the public around earth science topics, which now serves a several thousand people in British Columbia each year. And he was awarded the Bedford Young Mining Leaders Award from the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum in 2016 for his ongoing contributions to the industry. Just to give him a little bit of his background, um, he gained his bachelor's degree in environmental geoscience from the University of Cardiff in Wales. Outside his own business, Andy always sits also sits on the mentoring committee for the Engineering and Geoscientists of British Columbia and the Geological Society Committee for the CIM, 
and has several other community volunteer roles beyond the exploration industry. And that one here. There you are. <laughs> and I'll just flip. <laughs> So the bit that I really liked about that is that second case study was another one, another project we're putting through right now with SGS, so I've just found out the results as well. So it was furiously making notes over there. Well, it's pretty good, eh? I like it. Um, okay, so basically um, I was asked, because I've uh, done a few of these studies now, so we've heard the science behind it, so now let's put it into context of how this is helping me, helping my clients in the field. As I say, I'm a consultant geologist. We run everything from data entry to somebody to two, three year long drill programs, permitting schemes, the whole, the whole shebang. So um, I came to Sarah probably in about 2017 and I said, so I've got these really marginal projects that I'm working on and they're in really environmentally sensitive areas and you know, I just, there's no exposure, there's no, I just, I need more information. I need my drill core to tell me as much as I can get out of it. So we sat down and we kind of came up with a few ideas and it wasn't called ESME then, it wasn't even anything like this, but we were doing chem scan studies, we were doing that, so it kind of just built upon that. So I'm really pleased that we've actually kind of, that these guys took it, went, built it into a package, and now that, you know, we can see this being used through the industry. So I, this is a really hard little slide to put together, because it, it, you find that the results from this kind of seep into absolutely every part of your business. So how do we summarize that, how do we pull that out? So I pulled it into these four main areas, so uh, the effect on investment, the effect on growth, the effect on your relations with the stakeholders, and of course the geology itself. So we talked um, about that first case study which is called the Pluto Project. This was held by Strike Point Gold up in Yukon Territory. It's a big project, it's 35 kilometers by 25 kilometers. As of 2018, it had the most soil samples completed on it for any project in, uh, in the Yukon. Uh, over 100,000 soil samples, so a lot of data. Um, one of the zones in particular we called the Sharon zone. Um, we had a 15.43 gram per ton soil sample that came out of there. So obviously the soil just had, you know, a nice, nice little nugget of gold in there, I'm assuming. Um, and then grab samples from the same area, so actual physical rock samples, about 7.1 7 grams per ton gold as well. Uh, we also found little bits of copper, we were finding silver in there as well, but gold obviously the main one. Uh, on a regional scale, we're actually kind of right down, uh, if you take where white gold is and you just keep following the trend down, this property sits at the end of that trend, but outside of the area that they're considering the white gold district. So again, you know, you're thinking from, a, from an investor point of view, like, well, if I can draw a comparison to something else and make it look like that, then more people are going to be interested because everybody gets on the white gold bandwagon. So what we did on this site is my um, business model is to be as low impact as possible, to be as cheap as possible in the field, get out there, get the information, and really get everything you can from every rock that you pick up. So our drill program, obviously, you needed to do drilling, but it was first stage. We didn't want to go through the permitting process of going to a class three permit, so we went for a RAB drill, doesn't use water, so you don't need to permit that. It's track mounted, so we didn't need to build any roads. It could just be hella lifted in, and it could actually drive itself between the, the pads that we built, or the, the, the areas. We didn't actually need to build pads, because it doesn't, doesn't destroy anything. So again, super low um, impact there. First Nations and local stakeholders love that. We drilled the holes um, across this soil anomaly that we found. Um, what it turned out to be is actually it's like a, a, a big limestone bed that's running right through this property. So every time the hill and the valley dips in, on the side of the valleys you get these soil anomalies because it's, that's where it's outcropping. And we traced this, this massive limestone unit right the way across the property. So it's a huge sheet that's running through. Um, and there's these volcanic dikes that run up into it as well. If any of you have ever heard of the Carmax Caldera theory, it's kind of like crazy science, but I'm becoming more of a believer because of this. Yellowstone hotspot under the Yukon. Um, what we actually found though was that over a 600 by 600 meter area, we had fairly good results that were coming out of the ground. Um, 
you know, for example, there on hole number two, we had 15 meters, at just over a gram per ton gold, which, you know, okay, that's not gonna shake the markets down, but from, a, you know, comparing it to white gold in those areas, it was a pretty nice number, and it was by no means isolated. Some holes, though, were just coughing up copper numbers. So we had 32 meters at, you know, 0.14% copper, um, seven meters at 0.24% copper. So it was an interesting play. We've got chip samples. How do we really kind of pull that information out? So that's where I said to Sarah, hey, I've got a whole bunch of dusty rock chips for you. What do you think we can do with this? So we composited three of the holes. We went for different kinds of results and different lithology that we were seeing that just gave us as broad a representation of what this little pocket of geology could be. So the benefits, uh, geology, um, logging accuracy. So when you've got your teams out there logging, they know through the chem scan work that's been done what minerals we're running into. So there's none of that kind of, you know, four or five years of different geologists naming different minerals, different things, and then you have to go back and you have to look at it and you have to kind of reconstruct that. We did this in year one. We now have a mineral inventory for this project. Like, you know, there might be some unusual stuff, but if there is, it's going to be fairly minor. It's not going to be what we're, you know, we're focusing on. Uh, it helps to identify the most prospective units as well. So if you're looking at some, something like this, which seems to be strata bound, you know, it helped. Um, there was a lot of carbonate in this. So again, we're looking for those big scarn units. That's what we're trying to trace out on surface. Sometimes I find that when you just do grab sampling on surface or anything like that, you don't always get that definition. And certainly, you know, rab drilling isn't as good as diamond drilling for being able to give you that information. But through this study, we really did find that the high carbonate was what was helping. Um, also for team continuity, so the knowledge gets enshrined in the project. It's a report, it's empirical data, it's coming out of the chem scan, it's not somebody's interpretation of it, it's a machine that's gone, bam, 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 this is what these minerals are. So if that project now goes to another company or another team comes in or something like that, it's not having to reinvent the wheel each time. We're going to be able to just say, this is the information, do with it what you will, but you know, we waste a lot of money in this industry of going back and doing something that somebody's already done just to confirm it. So you know, a, a, a recent study like this I would find a lot more appealing to be able to trust. Um, and then for modeling, um, you know, just again, knowing which units, mineralization, alteration zones help. Um, and it really helped me focus in on where we were gonna drill. You know, because we were starting to see some gold come out in the shish units, but it, and the grades were okay, but the recoverability was worse. So what do we want to focus on in the first few years? We want to focus on where we can get this gold out of the ground and really build the numbers up there. Uh, how does it help us in the community? So as I said, in my environmentally sensitive area, there's no roads onto this site. Everything's flying in. It's actually overlapped by three main First Nations. Um, so we had to do a lot of consulting work up there with different people. They loved that we'd done this study when we went for the permitting because we could talk about exact, we had exact targeting after year one. We knew the kind of units we were after and therefore because we, we logged and mapped the whole area, we knew the areas we were going to focus in. It wasn't going to be, we might have teams out here, we might have teams out there. Uh, the White River First Nation, for example, their main concern was helicopter flight paths. So if we could say to them, well, actually, this is the area we're going to focus in because we know from this study that this is what we need to do, then we're only going to be focusing on there and not flying people all over the place. And they were really happy with that. That actually kind of greased the wheels a little bit with our, with our permit application. The uh, acid rock drainage. Uh, obviously, when you start drilling, holes can make water. What's the long-term uh, problems with that, if you have that? Thankfully, with this one, we didn't really have an ARD problem. But we actually knew that. We had data and evidence from this that, that gave us that information. So we could put that confidently into our permits. And also, again, stakeholder engagement. So all the local communities and, again, First Nations, if, they, if people know early on what the prospects of these kinds of sites are, um, it helps increase their confidence in it. It helps to show and demonstrate that you've done some science fairly early on and, and really kind of solidified this information. That helps with the permitting, and it also helps with your investors, because you can go back to the investors and say, we've done this, look, it's recoverable. We're not just chasing, you can go and get sexy gold numbers or sexy copper numbers anywhere, but if that copper's not recoverable, and you spend four or five years and a couple of hundred million dollars drilling it, and then find out that it's really not that recoverable, then is it best for you and is it best for your investors? 
which actually leads me on to the investment slide, which I covered most of all in there. Um, again, recovery of all samples and all minerals, that's always good to know, um, especially, again, when you're logging, if you're looking at the wrong kind of copper mineral. Um, we also found, like, when we went to PDAC, Denver Gold Show, a few other places afterwards, uh, investors, when we sat down and had, like, a race conference, we had, like, the face-to-face. -face. I even went to Germany in November and talked about this. They were so much more into the fact that we had this study. And I, from previous years where I've just gone in there and shown them a map of, look at all these cool soil samples that we've got, and we've got these, these hits. I can actually say and sit there and go, well, it's because we know it's coming from the chalcopyrite, and we know it's in these, these more kind of calcite-rich scarm beds. And if we're close to a nice volcanic dike, it really pumps the numbers. And that's what we're going to focus on. And we've got our permits coming through because we know this information after year one. Um, and it, just anything, anything I find that has solid scientific data, quantitative data, numerical data behind it is, is great. And it allowed the company to really focus where they were going to put their cash. So instead of being like, oh, we need to keep soil sampling, keep soil sampling, it was like, no, we know we can drill, we can focus in this area, and that's where we're going to see the results. And then overall growth of the property, I mean, I think I've kind of covered a lot of that, but again, more focused drilling, especially if you've got several ore zones. Strike Point Gold inherited this uh, original portfolio from um, Ryan Gold Corp that had, when I'm, I was the chief geologist for Ryan Gold, I had 88 properties across the Yukon that I used to look after. How do you divide up your exploration budget through that? So doing these kind of, uh, these kind of early stage tests really helps you go, okay, this is a dud. We don't need to keep funding this project. We can let this one go. This one's great. We should keep doing this. And we've not just done this from drill core. We've actually done it from surface samples as well. So we've taken like a nice quartz vein that's running on surface, submitted that for these kind of um, tests as well. So, you know, you don't have to get to the drill stage necessarily for this to be effective. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's just great. I love it. And, you know, if you, get, if you get the chance to go down, like when you've got your samples in there and you get your chance to go down and actually look and see these things going through, like I'm always there hanging around in the background. I think I've got my own glasses and lab coat now. Yeah, yeah that's it. Just kind of loiter around. But it's a fascinating process to watch if you've not got to see that, and it makes a lot more sense. And I've certainly dragged a few students in there as well and shown them the process. So, yeah, I, uh, I've used this now for a few different clients, and I've never had a negative response from it, even if the numbers aren't great, because the client goes, okay, well, we know, and now we walk away from it. And that's probably me done, I think. There you go. <laughs> Thank you.